Hi again. We're in chapter 8 now of This Freedom Wins by John Wesley Brady. And this chapter is entitled The Preaching of Social Righteousness. John Wesley goes after slavery. Here's a quote from Thoughts Upon Slavery from 1774 by Wesley. Give liberty to whom liberty is due, that is, to every child of man, to every partaker of human nature. Let none serve you, but by his own act and deed, by his own voluntary choice. Away with all whips, all chains, all compulsion. Be gentle toward all men. And then this from September 9th, 1776, a Wesley letter to the commissioners of excise. I have two silver spoons at London and two at Bristol. This is all the plate I have at present, and I shall not buy any more while so many round me want bread. Brady starts the chapter, The Preaching of Social Righteousness, this way. Because Wesley lived always in the consciousness of the spiritual world and sought ever to bring souls into communion with God by means of individual conversions, it often is assumed that he had small understanding of worldly affairs, that social questions were of little concern to him, and that he turned the minds of multitudes away from the vital problems of life to fix them on ethereal dreams of blessedness beyond. Such an assumption is a contortion of truth. It contains too little veracity for even the sorriest caricature. Wesley, preeminently, was a practical man. Never did he dodge the problems of life, he was drawn into closer and longer contact with the common people, the kingdom over, than any other man of, this, of his century. And his vivid consciousness of heaven and immortality provided him with a prototype for all human relationships on earth. It gave dignity to every political, economic, and financial question perplexing the life of man. Those economists and social historians who brush Wesley aside as a fanatical enthusiast hopelessly out of touch with practical problems, are reflecting not on Wesley, but on themselves. They show clearly their ignorance of evidence in which they should be versed. And then the subhead is Wesley's attacks on slavery. Wesley be being the central leader of the evangelical revival, and that revival being, as later will appear, the central inspiration both of the abolition of the empire slave trade in 1807 and of the emancipation of empire slaves in 1833-34, it follows that his teaching on this subject is of commanding interest. In 1774, 13 years before the famous Abolition Committee was formed, Wesley published his penetrating treatise, Thoughts Upon Slavery. And so direct, so graphic, so vehement is the argument therein expressed, the dissensitive reader perusing it even today must always hear, must almost hear Wesley's voice and feel the throb of his heart. After a restrained though ghastly portrayal of the inhumanity of slavery, he pierces prophetically to the moral issues involved. Countering the argument that the slave traffic was a legitimate business, he asks, can human law turn darkness into light or evil into good? Notwithstanding 10,000 laws, right is right and wrong is wrong still. I absolutely deny all slaveholding to be consistent with any degree of even natural justice. The whole business, he affirms, was pursued to get money, and its excuses were empty and hypocritical. I deny that villainy is ever necessary, he expostulates. A man can be under no necessity of degrading himself into a wolf. Proceeding, he dealt a timely blow at each at such loyalty as conceives empire and patriotism in terms only of mercantile or geographical expansion. For concerning the British West Indies, he urged, it's better that all these islands should remain uncultivated forever. Yea, it were more desirable that they were altogether sunk in the depth of the sea than they, that they should be cultivated at so high a price as the violation of justice, mercy, and truth. Wesley, being bred and educated in an ultra-conservative environment, his whole tradition of life was conservative. Even his conversion never completely freed him from this traditional bias. As, was, as with Luther and Descartes, many of the influences of early training survived catastrophic change. 
Yet when national custom or social sanction blocked the road to liberty and progress, Wesley's religious convictions compelled him to become a radical reformer. Are not stubbornness, cunning, pilfering, and diverse other vices the natural and necessary fruits of slavery, he demands? In addressing the slave owners, he asks, What wonder if they, your slaves, should cut your throats? And if they did, whom could you blame for it but yourselves? As for slave merchants, he reminds them that men buyers are on a level with men stealers. You know, he continues, that your slaves are procured by means nothing near so innocent as picking of pockets, housebreaking, or robbery upon the highway. Now, remembering that for decades following the printing of this treatise, the slave trade was protected by law, and that the said merchants were eminently wealthy, respectable citizens, we realize that Wesley's language was scarcely parliamentary. Indeed, two generations later, his disciple, Reverend J. R. Stevens of factory reform fame, was clapped into prison for language only a shade more provocative than that of his great spiritual father. But reverting to these slave merchants, Wesley further exclaimed, You are the spring that puts all the rest in motion, captains, slave owners, kidnappers, murderers. Thy brother's blood crieth unto thee. Thy hands, thy bed, thy furniture, thy house, thy lands are at present stained with blood. Whether you are a Christian or not, show yourself a man. Be not more savage than a lion or a bear. I'll put in a link to the work of someone I knew nothing about when I was a Jehovah's Witness, William Wilberforce, who was a next generation disciple of John Wesley in this great revival, the great revival, the evangelical revival of the, 19th, of the 18th century.